First Church. Good to see all of you today. Uh, getting started. I'm sure that's fine. Um, I want to first uh, thank Rick for filling in for me last Sunday. I appreciate his ministry, and I wish I could have been here for that. Uh, the sermon looked very interesting, so um, when I get to heaven, I'll ask for a replay. <laughs> Um, anyway, thank you so much. And uh, glad to see everyone today. Uh, let's stand and hear our call to worship this morning from Psalm 84, verses 1 through 4. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young. A place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Our Father in heaven, we would join the created world order and the heavens, heavenly host above in singing your praises and magnifying your glorious name. We thank you for your mercies and love. We thank you for your amazing grace to us in Christ, for the riches of salvation that we've received in him. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We pray that your Spirit will strengthen us for worship this day and bless our time together. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Please remain standing and Rick will introduce our first name. Sing glorious things of thee are spoken, 345.
Let's remain standing and we'll confess the Apostles' Creed together. Congregation of the people of God, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. washings, 
regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. But when Christ appeared as a high priest, as a, as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience and from dead works to serve the living God. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant.
today. We begin a new chapter. Exodus 26. If you will take a moment to turn to that chapter in your Bibles. And we'll read through the chapter. <coughs> the chapter. And I was tempted to just read a portion of it to give you the flavor of it. But I think it's important to read the whole of the text. So bear with me as we make our way through this chapter. Wherever you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twined linen, and blue and purple and scarlet yarns, you shall make them with cherubim skillfully worked into them. The length of each curtain shall be twenty-eight cubits, and the breadth of each curtain four cubits. All the curtains shall be the same size. Five curtains shall be coupled to one another. And the other five curtains shall be coupled to one another. And you shall make loops of blue on the edge of the outermost curtain in the first set. Likewise, you shall make loops on the edge of the outermost curtain in the second set. Fifty loops you shall make on the one curtain, and fifty loops you shall make on the edge of the curtain that is in the second set. The loops shall be opposite one another. And you shall make fifty clasps of gold, and couple the curtains one to the other with the clasps, so that the tabernacle may be a single whole. You shall also make curtains of goat's hair for a tent over the tabernacle. Eleven curtains shall you make. The length of each curtain shall be thirty cubits, and the breadth of each curtain four cubits. The eleven curtains shall be the same size. You shall couple five curtains by themselves, and six curtains by themselves, and the sixth curtain you shall double over at the front of the tent. You shall make fifty loops on the edge of the curtain that is outermost in one set, and fifty loops on the edge of the curtain that is outermost in the second set. You shall make fifty clasps of bronze, and put the clasps into the loops, and couple the tent together, that it may be a single whole. And the part that remains of the curtains of the tent, the half curtain that remains, shall hang over the back of the tabernacle. And the extra that remains in the length of the curtains, the cubit on the one side and the cubit on the other side, shall hang over the sides of the tabernacle, on this side and that side, to cover it. And you shall make for the tent a covering of tanned ram's skins and a covering of goat skins on top. You shall make upright frames for the tabernacle of acacia wood. Ten cubits shall be the length of a frame, and a cubit and a half the breadth of each frame. There shall be two tenons in each frame for fitting together. So shall you do for all the frames of the tabernacle. You shall make the frames for the tabernacle, 20 frames for the south side, and 40 bases of silver you shall make under the 20 frames, two bases under one frame for its two tenons, and two bases under the next frame for its two tenons. And for the second side of the tabernacle, on the north side, 20 frames, and there are 40 bases of silver, two bases on under one frame, and two bases under the next frame. And for the rear of the tabernacle westward, you shall make six frames. And you shall make two frames for the corners of the tabernacle in the rear, and they shall be separate beneath but joined at the top, at the first ring. Thus shall it be with both of them, they shall form the two corners. And there shall be eight frames with their bases of silver, sixteen bases, two bases under one frame, and two bases under another frame. You shall make bars of acacia wood, five for the frames on the one side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the frames of the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the frames 
of the side of the tabernacle at the rear, westward. The middle bar, halfway up the frames, shall run from end to end. You shall overlay the frames with gold, and shall make their rings of gold for holders on the bars. And you shall overlay the bars with gold. Then you shall erect the tabernacle according to the plan for it that you were shown on the mountain. And you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. It shall be made with cherubim skillfully worked into it. And you shall hang it on four pillars of acacia overlaid with gold, with hooks of gold on four bases of silver. And you shall hang the veil from the clasps, and bring the ark of the testimony in there within the veil. And the veil shall separate for you the holy place from the most holy. <clears throat> you shall put the mercy seat on the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. And you shall set the table outside the veil, and the lampstand on the south side of the tabernacle opposite the table. You shall put the table on the north side. You shall make a screen for the entrance of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen embroidered with needlework. And you shall make for the screen five pillars of acacia and overlay them with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold and you shall cast five bases of bronze for them. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for the descriptions that it gives to us of this earthly tabernacle. We thank you for the pattern that it places before us of that heavenly temple where Christ dwells even now. We do thank you, O oh God, for your word and pray for the help of your spirit that we would understand what you would have us to learn from this. Strengthen us in our understanding of your word, bless our faith, and equip us then to live for you with hearts filled with joy and gratitude for all that you've done for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One day when President Reagan was in office, a man named George Gilbert walked in and uh, put in front of him in his hand a computer chip. And he said, Mr. President, this computer chip is the future of the world. George Gilbert is uh, known for his uh, futuristic look at uh, technology and how things will develop in the course of time. He has done much to advance uh, a capitalist system that flourishes and causes uh, the growth of all kinds of inventive ideas. Uh, George Gilbert uh, was involved with another uh, inventor in building a uh, like a theater based on the movie Back to the Future. You remember in that movie, Dr. Brown had a car, a DeLorean car, that was uh, in some ways souped up so that it could travel through time, go back into history. And uh, Michael J. Fox starred in the show and uh, some of you who are younger may have an opportunity at some point to watch that movie again. But George Gilder and a friend of his built this uh, theater with the DeLorean car that could move just a little bit here and there. But as you're in the car, you have this theater projection all around you and you see yourself going back into time, back into the early beginnings of the, the ice age of the earth and so forth. And you're traveling through time, it's only about four minutes, but you feel like you're moving in this car. And George Gilder uses this as an illustration of how uh, we need to go beyond our ordinary sense perceptions and look at the world from a, a wider point of view. He quotes in his book, Life After Google, the uh, statement by C.S. Lewis about raising the question how would somebody who lived in a two-dimensional universe, 
with just length and, and breadth available to them. They can only see everything on that one plateau, and they can measure things and see this sort of thing. But they had no perception of height and depth. They did not have three dimensions in front of them. How would a person in a two-dimensional world understand a third dimension? It would go beyond all that they're used to and all that they've experienced. And so Gilder says, this is what has to happen in our day today. And in particular, as he talks about life after Google, he talks about how the Google company is a company that's given over to mathematics and to humanistic reasoning. Everything is materialistic in their worldview. It's a two-dimensional view of the world. And he argues that there's also a third dimension, the spiritual realm, where there is a creator overall. And there is the opportunity to advance uh, in culture in different ways. If you've ever sat down and taken a, a set of instructions and tried to put something together, you know how frustrating it can be to look through the directions, even when they have perhaps a, a little description or a, a picture graph of what you're working with, it's sometimes hard to follow these instructions. And so similarly, as we go through Exodus 26, it's like reading through an instruction manual and going point by point. There are five curtains here, you stitch them all together, then five curtains here, you stitch them together, and take these two big blankets of curtains and you bring them together, put uh, blue uh, uh, wraps on them and, and gold clasps and hold it all, the whole thing together. And you're going through one point after the other and say, what is this? How does this all fit together? So you've got these curtains, and then curtains on top of curtains, or really covers on top of the curtains. Then you've got walls going up, and different rooms and segment rooms, and then you've got uh, the construction of the walls and so forth. And it gets to be a little bit overwhelming to read through it. It's kind of like reading through the genealogies of the Bible, or reading through the book of Leviticus and struggling with all these different kinds of offerings and stuff like that, so things which are so foreign to us. But today I hope that first we'll be able to understand the instructions a little bit further, but then see something of the depth, the architecture of this, the whole theological architecture of this tabernacle that was constructed for uh, the nation of Israel. And see that there is a third dimension to it. There's much more than what you see there on the surface, perhaps on the page of Scripture and all of its minute descriptions. Uh, after all, when we are looking at a sermon or reading a book, we like drama, we like action, we like dialogue and that sort of thing. Here is just instructions. <laughs> a long list of instructions. But the interesting thing is that in the 30th verse, God reminds Moses that when you build this tabernacle, you are to build it after the pattern I showed to you on the mountain. In some ways, to Moses, it's a reminder that there's more than the two dimensions of the script, the, the uh, verbal description of how this tabernacle is to be built. Moses saw the pattern itself. He saw how it was supposed to look as a completed product. And so I'm sure that if there were any questions on the part of those who constructed the tabernacle, they could come to Moses and say, just exactly how is this supposed to work together? And Moses could guide them with that. Build it according to the pattern that God has given to you, has shown to you in the mountain. Um, that applies not only to the construction of the tabernacle, but everything surrounding this tabernacle, and indeed the whole gospel message that flows out of this tabernacle. There is a revelation from God that comes to us, and we need to follow that pattern of Scripture and hold to it carefully so that we might understand the blessings that come through this tabernacle and all that it foreshadows and portends. In some respects, this is like that little computer chip that George Gilder placed before President Reagan. It has within it all kinds of information, and it can do all kinds of things. Later, George Gilder would predict that someday people would have something in their pockets. Oh, it's back there. Uh, something they could have in their pockets that would do all kinds of math problems, and they could watch TV on it, they could uh, pay their bills on it, 
all kinds of things. And at the time, back in the 80s, I thought that sounded like an amazing thing, just a little bit wild. But a, a fellow by the name of uh, what is it, uh, Steve Jobs for Apple read what he had to say, which, what Gilder had to say. And now we have something called the iPhone. This pocket computer with all kinds of information. That's an amazing thing. But you go from the computer chip to the iPhone, and there are greater things yet to come. Similarly, when we look at this tabernacle, we, we see the information that God gives to us here, but there's so much more ahead. So much more to see and to understand. And so we need to be, ha, have some patience as we go through this text, reflect on it a little bit, and see it in the, the broader context of redemptive history and what God was going to do for us through the Christ of the tabernacle. When you look at this chapter, there are really three sections involved in the chapter. And this doesn't give us the whole of the tabernacle setting because you have the tabernacle, the most holy place and the holy place here, and the coverings around that. That's what this chapter deals with. But there's also a little bit more to come. that will come in the 27th chapter, which is the, the exterior court. And that court is going to be a, a, going to have a wall around it of curtains that's like 100 cubits in length, 50 cubits in width, and uh, same thing and so forth. And so uh, there's more to come. And actually, it's best to understand everything all together because there's a certain element to the construction of this that reminds us that we're not to look at this on the two-dimensional level of things. As you read through it, we'll get into the curtains and the, the walls and so forth, but pay attention to the basis of all things. And perhaps to the golden clasps up above or the bronze clasps on the uh, goat hair covering. Silver and bronze. Now in the tabernacle here, you have the, the walls based on these silver bases. On each of the posts and the, 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 the panels that go around the tabernacle. When you go out to the front of the tabernacle, you have uh, these five posts that go up and hold the, the, the front screen, the, the curtain that's in the front that is the entryway into the whole tabernacle. The bases of these posts are bronze. Silver around the tabernacle, bronze at the entry, entryway. When you go out into the court and look at the, the curtains all around that courtyard, the bases are all bronze. And Ver Poitras, in his uh, book on the, the law of, of Moses, has an amazing insight into this where he shows that the silver was a representative of the atmosphere. And the effect of this was that the, the tabernacle, the holy place, the most holy place, was to appear architecturally as though it were elevated above the earth. And the courtyard represented the earth. And so the uh, tabernacle was a representation, you recall, we, we mentioned last time, of the, uh, the highest heavenly places where God himself dwells above with the angels, the cherubim, and so forth. That's the most holy place represented here in the tabernacle. And then you have the heavens above, the star, the sun, the sun, the stars, the moon, and so forth. That's represented in the holy place with the lampstand, uh, with the seven lamps on it, and, and then the bread of the presence. And so here you have uh, the, the heavenly places uh, the, the bread comes down from heaven and feeds Israel through the, the wilderness wandering. And then you go out from there, you have the land of Canaan, represented by the courtyard, where the general people could come in. And there was this bronze altar, like a fireplace in the front of the tabernacle complex, and then a bronze laver, which was kind of a, a, a place to, to bathe, to wash your hands. And so... The atmospheric look of the tabernacle is that you have the, the holy place and the most holy place, architecturally speaking, floating above the earth with its courtyard. And so that's something of, of again, a breaking of the two-dimensional mold 
and seeing the three dimensions, that there's a heavenly meaning behind all that we're seeing here. So we get into the construction of the tabernacle, and we have first the, the instructions about the, the curtains that cover the tabernacle in verses 1 through about 14. Then in verses 15 and following, we have instructions with regard to the frame that goes around the tabernacle, the wood uh, panels that stand upright and are situated around the, the panel, around the tabernacle. And then you have, at the conclusion of the chapter, uh, descriptions of the veils, or the curtains that divided the most holy place, also called the Holy of Holies, and the Holy Place. So there was that major veil that stood in front of the Ark of the Covenant on the one side, with the cherubim on top of that, and the Holy of Holies. And on the other side of this veil was the uh, altar of incense, and then the uh, lampstand on the south side, the table of the showbread, uh, the bread of the presence on the north side, the entrance to the east. At the entrance to the east, there was another curtain, a veil as well. Uh, there are differences between these two veils, which we'll talk about in a moment. But that's the, the, the big ideas of the chapter here. When we look at the curtains, you find that it, it begins by talking about a curtain of linen, twined linen, with yarn colored in purple, blue, and scarlet. This is something that I, I struggled to try to visualize. Was it three, four different curtains, one of linen, one of blue, scarlet, and purple? Or is it one curtain with a, a, a linen side, much like your curtain at home, you have one side that might be on a white uh, uh, poplin or something like that, and then you have the, the colored fabric on the, other, on the other side. Is that kind of what we have here? It, it seems that from what I read from the commentators, at least, you have a linen curtain with the, the threads of the blue, purple, and scarlet going through the linen. I'm not quite sure how that all works, but it's there. And then we'll see as well that there is embroidered into this by a craftsman a, a, a picture or a depiction of the cherubim as well on these curtains. So let's say it's one curtain, it seems to be what the text is saying, one curtain, the base fabric is linen, then you have the, these yarns weaved into it of blue, purple, and scarlet colors. Very colorful curtain. And then with the emblem of the cherubim uh, designed into that as well. I imagine that's a, a gold thread or something to that effect to depict the cherubim. The curtains have, have, are designed in panels. There are 28 cubits in length and four cubits wide. You've got five of them put together, stitched together. So it is basically 20 cubits wide and 28 cubits in length. Now I'm going to talk in cubits here and not constantly go back to the feet so that we get kind of confused with what's going on here. But you remember the cubit is about the size of a man's forearm, about 18 inches from elbow to the tip of his fingers. That's one cubit. And so these curtains were 28 cubits. I'll take us to the back of the room here quite a bit. Let me measure that out. <laughs> but 28 cubits in length, four cubits in width, and then you got five of them attached together on one side, five on the other, and then these two big panels of curtains are held together by rings of gold uh, held with uh, blue, blue uh, uh, rings to them. So here's the, the curtain. What does it, this mean? Well, first of all, the length of the curtain at 28 cubits is not going to cover completely the tabernacle. You recall the size of the tabernacle is 10 cubits high, 10 cubits wide, then again 10 cubits down, and a length of 10 cubits as well for the most holy place, the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies was a cube, 10 cubits in height, width, and depth. So that's going from one side 
side to the other, that's 30 cubits all the way around. 10 up, 10 over, 10 down. This tent curtain is 28 cubits. So there's going to be a cubit on one side and a cubit on the other side where the curtain is off the ground. In this way, people who are outside the tabernacle are not going to see this curtain, except perhaps on those occasions when the tabernacle is torn down and they carry out the curtain and they can see something of what's going on there. In any case, there's that gap there between the curtain and the floor. It seems to me that we have a couple of things going on here with this curtain. The colors to the curtain, the uh, blue, purple, and scarlet, are, it seems to be, an allusion to the glory cloud that hovered over Mount Sinai, first of all. Remember the fire, the clouds, and the, the dark clouds, uh, a depiction of that glory cloud coming upon Mount Sinai, and then as well the glory cloud that led the people of Israel through uh, the wilderness, across the Red Sea, and then into uh, up towards Mount Sinai. This glory cloud was a fire by day, excuse me, a, a cloud by day, and a fire by night. And so the, these colors, the scarlet depicting the fire, the blues and the purples, the, the clouds uh, depicting the, the glory cloud that came over the tabernacle. The glory cloud was the presence of the Spirit of the Christ. Christ himself coming with his Spirit upon that tabernacle, indwelling the tabernacle. The Ark of the Covenant would be the footstool for the great King who inhabits the heavens above, but he reigns from the earth as well. And the glory cloud is depicted by the, this tent curtain that covers the tent. God hovers over his people. And God is pleased to dwell in the midst of his people in the form of a tent, which reminds us of the great condescension of God to meet with us where we are at. The people of Israel were very familiar with tents. They traveled about in tents. They were a nomadic people at this time. They didn't have a permanent residence. And so God did not instruct Moses to build a temple there at Mount Sinai, a building of stone and so forth that is immovable. But he had Moses build a tabernacle, a tent. And so just as the people lived in tents, God also dwelt with them in a tent. And to me, it, it's a rather remarkable thing that God looks upon us in our particular stage in life, where we are at, and He's pleased to come and dwell with us through His Son, Christ. Jesus is the one who is the a tabernacle of God among us. We recall in John chapter 1, John says that Jesus uh, came and dwelt among us. The Greek word there is really a word which echoes the idea of tabernacling among us. He dwelt among us in his flesh. His flesh was his earthly tabernacle. Jesus came and met us where we are at. He lived in this world with all of its troubles, all of its problems, all of its pain. He suffered in this world. The opposition of his enemies, also the death on the cross. Jesus underwent all things for us. He knew us, he understood us, and came into our world for us. This is the condensation of God, his willingness to be with us. Paul puts it most memorably in Philippians chapter 2 where he speaks of how uh, he who uh, dwelt in the presence of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to. He didn't clutch to his privileges as the eternal Son of God, but he emptied himself of his glory and took on our humanity and became a servant and went to the cross. This is God's condescension for us and our salvation. And so it is whatever circumstance in which you are in life, Whoever God has positioned you, whether you live in a very wealthy home or a rented room, God is pleased to dwell with you. Whether you have the most healthy body or a body that is weak and troubled, aging or sick or what have you, 
God is pleased to dwell in you. To be with you. To be your comfort and strength. To bring blessings to you. Read that 84th Psalm that we read earlier today. Of how salvation comes from the presence of the Lord. How God gives us His blessing from His sanctuary. God comes to dwell with you and even within you. We become the temple of God through the redemptive work of Christ. God dwells in us. And so we are blessed with the presence of God in our midst. So this tent curtain with, with all these different colors shows the presence of the Spirit of the Christ upon this tabernacle. It's covered with a, a, a curtain of uh, probably black goat's hair, which the people understood. Uh, and this was 30 cubits in length, so it went the whole way down and covered the whole tabernacle, so now you couldn't see what was going on underneath there. It was all covered up. There is something like mystery to what goes on in the most holy place. The ordinary people could not see it. There were kind of barriers to the people. There were the walls that would be set up. We'll talk about it in a moment. There were the curtains that covered the whole thing. And this black goat's hair curtain would remind Israel that God is distant from us. In some ways, there's a certain mystery to God. He is transcendent. He is the creator of all things. And so, He far surpasses us. And if we wish to know Him, He must reveal Himself to us. He must open a way into His presence. Otherwise, He remains at a distance from us. There's the goat's hair covering there. And then there are the skins of goats that are uh, covering it along with... Uh, now this word is a little bit difficult to figure out in the Hebrew. Uh, the best translation that we have seems to be uh, the skin of sea cows. And Mount Sinai was close to the, the sea, and so they could probably get something, maybe there was a sea cow, whatever that is, kind of like a walrus bathing on the shoreline or something like that, and they were able to skin that and make use of the skins and, and put them over the tabernacle. That would protect it. That would be like a weatherized coating for the tabernacle to protect it from bad weather and so forth. And so this is how God covers the tabernacle. Um, the one, the ghost skins were uh, dyed. Now, the English standard says they were tan. Other translations say they were red in color. Maybe it's a reflection that God provides us with the skins of animals to cover us in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned against God. And the animals were, were slaughtered to cover Adam and Eve's nakedness, their sin. And in anticipating Christ's work, where he would have to shed his blood so that we might be covered by him and washed from our sins. And so this is there over the, the tabernacle, uh, these uh, coverings on, on there. Now that's the tent, but the tent needs something to hold it up. And that would be the walls that go around. And the walls were built of acacia wood. There were uh, panels side by side after each other. And then there was something called a, a, a tenon, which is kind of like a, a tongue and groove sort of thing where, where it, the two walls will connect and be joined together. And then there are the silver bases that hold them upright. So these walls are about 10 cubits high. It's 15 feet high, maybe close to what we have here. Then you create, that would be the, the sides of these panels then they're put together 20 on the south side, 20 on the north side, 6 on the west side, nothing on the east side because that would be the entrance and there would be the curtain there that would allow people to come in. So, and then you have two corners here on the, the south and north corners that were doubled to add to the stability of the structure and the frame. And the further you have these wooden bars going through the rings, five of them in a row, to hold these panels together. Everything plated with gold. So, this was an amazing tabernacle to look at. If you were to come inside, you would see these golden walls, the golden lampstand, the table with its gold, and you come into the most holy place, and the Ark of the Covenant is all 
covered in gold. You have the gold cherubim covering over the mercy seat. And the gold walls all around you, polished. This is really amazing. We come into it. Then you have this blue, red, and scarlet, or blue, red, and purple curtain with the cherubim emblazoned in it, both in, in the, the uh, curtain between the holy place and most holy place, but also in the curtains that cover the whole sanctuary. They have the same design on them. It's an amazing place to be. God dwells among us in humility, but there is glory to the presence of God. There is wonder, a, if you will, a richness, a wealth to God in His wisdom, His knowledge, His love, His goodness, His grace. And all these things are here before us in this tabernacle. The walls remind us that there are boundaries to the kingdom of God. There are those who are inside and those who are outside. And the walls protect people, or protect the, the place from people who are not worthy from coming in. God does not immediately just reveal himself completely to us. In the course of history, there is a gradual unfolding of God's revelation of himself through time. And there are barriers set at the beginning. Into the most holy place, only the high priest could enter once a year at the Day of Atonement. That was the only time anyone could go into that most holy place. None of the regular Jewish people could do that. They all had to stay well outside. And so there were barriers reminding us of our sin and the corruption of our sin and how we need an atonement to be reconciled to God. This leads us to consider the, the veils between the, the holy place, the most holy place, and then the entrance to the tabernacle. The, the veil in, inside at, at the most holy place was the scarlet, purple, and blue colors, and it had the cherubim emblazoned on it. So again, the angelic courtroom of the heavenly king. You're entering into the presence of God in his heavenly throne. The other curtain, as you enter into the tabernacle, does not have the cherubim on it. It does have the red, or the scarlet, blue, and purple uh, colors to it. But it does not have the cherubim. It's also on the basis of bronze. It's leading into the earth and this earthly realm. You have this veil that, if you will, hides God from us, from those of us who are sinners. How can we have fellowship with this God? How can we enter into his presence? Well, the solution of that comes with uh, the, the coming of Christ who tabernacled among us, who became flesh for us, the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and this one would uh, go to the cross and his body would be torn for us at the cross. And then subsequent to his death in the temple there in Jerusalem, the veil, which was much higher than the 15 or the 10 cubits here in the uh, tabernacle, the temple veil was, I think, 15 cubits, so a good deal higher, and it's very thick. Josephus says that the, the veil itself was like a, a hand breadth in, in thickness to the thing. So you're not just going to tear it. But with the death of Christ, that veil was torn from top to bottom, signifying that an entrance has now been provided to the people of God into the very presence of God. The old tabernacle and temple worship have come to an end. We now enter into the very presence of God through the redeeming work of Christ. And this is the point that the writer to the Hebrews makes to us in the ninth and also the 10th chapters, that how Christ in his flesh was the veil that was torn for us so that we might have an entrance into the very presence of God. And so in worship here this morning, we dwell in the presence of God. Thankfully, God does not reveal his glory and majesty to us in its fullness here. But there's coming a day when we will pass into the great city yet to come, the temple that comes from above. I should say the city of Jerusalem that comes in the form of a temple. It's a cube. The most holy place come, 
them upon earth, and we will dwell with God forever and ever in the presence of God. And know Him like we've never known Him here in this world. So we have this wonderful tabernacle set up for us, a pattern given to us, which reminds us of uh, the, the dwelling of the Spirit of God among His people, of Christ dwelling with us. It reminds us of the boundaries that exist between us and God, and the need to have our sins atoned for so that we might have fellowship with God. And then we're reminded of the coming of the Christ, and how He alone would be the one who would open the way into the presence of God for us, so that we might have fellowship with Him. We are the tabernacle of God. God dwells within us. And what a blessing it is to know that the computer chip of long ago has now come into this full fruition in terms of God dwelling with His people. Uh, we'll finish here and we'll pick up our, our study next time when we'll begin to look at the, the bronze altar out in front and the labor as well and we'll consider further the outer court in, in the week to come. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the work of your spirit and applying these things to our hearts and minds. We pray that you would Give us an appreciation for this revelation of yourself and your glory, your dwelling among us in a humble way. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to live for you and rejoice in your goodness and love to us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond to the ministry of God's word by bringing before the Lord our morning tithes and offerings.
and having given thanks as has been done in his name, he gave it to his disciples as I, ministering in his name, give this cup to you.
and the testimony of Grace's life to the members of the Baldwin family who may yet be outside of uh, faith. We do pray, Lord, for your hand of blessing on uh, that whole family. We thank you, Father, for watching over our elderly and pray that you would be with them. We thank you for your care for Rhoda, for Manuel, for uh, George. Uh, we do pray, Lord, for your blessings on them. Be with Eve as well. And we pray that, that you watch over and provide for them. We do pray that you would bless those of us who are aging in life. We pray that we grant us grace to trust in you for all things. We thank you for our, our young families and for those who are growing up. We do pray for your blessing on the children that are here this day. We thank you for them. And we pray that your spirit be at work in each heart and each life, and bringing them to a saving knowledge of Christ and faithful service in his kingdom. Father, we pray that you would uh, be with those who are traveling. We pray that you be with uh, Carolyn as she is in Arizona. We thank you for her safety and her travels and pray that you give her a blessed time there. And as she has occasion to visit family in California, we pray for your blessing on that as well. Father, we thank you for uh, our members in New York and in Florida. We think of uh, Chuck and Tamara and pray for your blessing and vision for them, be with Chuck's parents, Chuck and Pauline. We thank you for them and their fellowship with us, and we pray, Lord, that you would minister to their spiritual needs, their needs for fellowship and growth and grace, and we pray that you protect them from all harm and evil. We pray for Jack and Linda and Dale in Florida. We pray, Lord, that you would bless them and provide for their spiritual uh, well-being. We thank you for them and for their ministry with us while they were here. We pray for your blessing on them. Father, we pray that you would bless our country. Please forgive us for our many sins. We pray, Lord, that you would continue your work of grace in the lives of the churches across our nation. Uh, bless your kingdom, O Lord, and deliver us from evil and the evil one. I pray for my friend in Ukraine, Katya. Pray, Lord, that you would protect her from harm, protect her parents as well. We thank you for um, your, your care for them and in the course of this uh, war, and we pray, Lord, that you would be at work in bringing peace to that uh, part of the world, and we pray for your church in Ukraine and for your people in Russia as well, that you would watch over them, secure their faith, and bless them and their witness to their nations and their neighbors. We pray, Lord, for your many blessings on us uh, throughout our days. Uh, prosper us in our homes and our families, cause us to flourish in Christ, and we pray that you would be glorified in us. And they ask that you would teach us to pray, even as our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Very cool. Be our final hand. Closing hymn is Fairest Lord Jesus, hymn number 170. <clears throat> Fairest Lord Jesus, hymn number 170.
Thank you.